Hello and welcome back. Today I want to continue talking about circuit loops. By taking a closer look at a switching converter and seeing how the size of the circuit loop has an effect on its performance. In particular, since switching converters are known for being noisy, I will be analyzing the amount of magnetic emissions. So if you're curious about how the layout of a converter can impact its noise performance, then keep watching. So let's start things off with a few words about the test circuit and the test setup that we will be using today. So as converter, I will be using the AP3012 integrated boost converter. And I've chosen this particular part mainly because of the simplicity of the circuit that you need to build around it to, well, create a switching converter. So other than the IC itself, you just need an external inductor diode, input output capacitors and the feedback divider. And that's that. So this is the exact circuit that I will be using today with the exact values. So my output voltage is somewhere around 12 volts based on the feedback divider and I will be supplying the circuit with 5 volts. And as a load, I will be using an active load, so an active load that I've built in an older video, and I will be setting it to around 100 milliamps. Now, to analyze the noise coming from our circuit, today I will be using the spectrum analyzer that is set to measure into the range between 1 megahertz and 400 megahertz. So just below our switching frequency and up until a point where most of the noise completely dies down. And to perform the measurement, I will be using a magnetic field probe that I built in an older video. Now, this frequency range also includes the FM band, so 88 to 108 megahertz in the region where I live. And we can clearly see this right here in our measurement. So with an unshielded setup, this noise coming from the local radio stations is quite predominant. So to get rid of it, what I'll be needing is a shielded enclosure. And for that, I'll be using a cookie box, but not just any cookie box, Fest Cookies. So this will be today's shielded enclosure. Now, just by placing the probe inside of the shielded enclosure doesn't help that much. So you can clearly still see our FM noise. So to get this thing to actually shield something, we need to connect the shield to the ground of our measurement setup because otherwise this is just a floating shield, so it's not really that useful. So I have this little wire connected to the casing, and I will also connect this to the ground of the probe. And by doing this, we can see that our FM band almost completely disappeared. So now our setup is shielded, and we have quite a decent noise floor, so we can start to perform our measurements. And the final setup element to mention is this plastic holder thingy. So I built this thing to hold the PCB in place in reference to the measurement probe. So the center of the measurement probe is always just below the switching IC of the power supply. And all my boards will have the exact same dimension. So they can always sit in this thing and in the same place in reference to the measurement probe. And well, this whole thing will sit inside of the shielded enclosure. So now let's have a look at our first test board. So just like every other board, it's a 5x5 PCB. It's a single layer board, so all of the components and interconnections fit on the same layer. And for this particular design, I kept the components quite spread out. So even though I'm using quite small components, the gaps in between the components are quite large. And while this is just to show a bad example, so don't build your converters like this. This is just for explanation purposes. And if we measure this, so I place my board inside my plastic adapter with the near field probe inside of the box. On the output, I have my active load with an milliamp meter and I'm supplying the circuit from a five volt power supply. So let's just close everything up. So we still see a bit of noise mainly coming from the cabling going into the shielded enclosure. So it's not perfect. But anyway, if we now turn on the circuit. So you can see it's applying about 100 milliamps on the output and we can clearly see the noise spectrum. So what we can see here is our fundamental switching frequency with all of the harmonics and these slowly die down 
so as expected for a square wave, but then we also see this extra high frequency noise appearing. So this is mainly caused by ringing in the switching node and, well, the loops in the circuit. Now, how do we fix this? Well, last time I looked at how audio amplifiers are affected by the size of the circuit loop, the smaller the circuit loop was, the more immune the circuit was. And this was caused not by component values or the schematic behind the circuit, but rather the size of the circuit loops. So how will small loops affect our switching converter? Well, to answer that question, the second board for today looks something like this. So what I did here was keep the board size first of all the same and the schematic behind the circuit is the same, but all of the components have been brought as close together as possible. So the overall area of the converter has been reduced to at least half of the initial area. So let's see what sort of impact this has. So now I've added in our second board. Let's just close up the setup. And if we rerun and turn on the power supply, of course, we see a completely different story. So our noise seems to have gone quite significantly down. But to get a better look at exactly what happened, let's compare the two measurements on the computer. So I overlap the two measurements. In pink we see our initial measurement and in white our new measurement. And while well, apart from a slight shift in the switching frequency, this is perfectly normal because the IC has quite a widespread switching frequency, it's not very well controlled, we can see quite a substantial reduction in noise. So I have about 10 decibels per division, and we can see that there's quite a big improvement both with the switching frequency and the harmonics, as well as with this high frequency noise appearing above 100 MHz. So all over the place there's at least 10-15 decibels of noise reduction. Therefore, just like with immunity problems, when you have emissions problems, keeping the loops of your circuit smaller will improve performance. But what does it mean to keep a loop small? And more importantly, what do you do if you don't have the luxury of working with tiny components? So this converter can barely handle a few watts of power, so it's perfectly normal that it can fit into a square centimeter. But if your converter needs to handle, say, a kilowatt, then you're going to need slightly larger components than this. So what do you do then? I mean, if you don't really have small components and you can't bring them together, how do you keep your circuit loop small? Well, to analyze this case, I will start off with our very first circuit, so all the components spread out, but rather than bringing the components together, I will try to reduce the circuit loops by only affecting the layout. Now, at this point, it's important to remember why large circuit loops are a problem. So, a circuit loop is basically created by components interconnected with some trace. And the length of the circuit loop is well defined by how much trace there is and how big the components are. And what we have here is basically a single turn, single air inductor. And now, the inductance of such a structure is mainly defined by its enclosed surface area. So for a given amount of perimeter, so a given amount of length of loop, there are two extreme surface areas that we can create. So on the one side we can build a structure that looks like a circle, so this has the maximum amount of enclosed surface area, and on the other side we can bring the traces as close together as possible, so we create a much longer structure, but the enclosed surface area is much much smaller. So if we bring the traces into a rectangle shape, we can get very, very small enclosed surface areas. And well, the inductance of the two constructions will be, of course, proportional to the enclosed surface area. So with a circular structure, we get a very high loop inductance. With a small rectangular structure, we get a very small loop inductance. So well, if your purpose is to reduce the inductance of the loop, you can try out something like this. And to put this topic to the test, my next board is again the same size as before, the same schematic as before, and also the component placement, so where exactly the components are on the board, are just like with our very first board, so the one with the wide loops, but what I tried to do here was to keep the loop small in detriment of trace length. So I brought all of the traces as close together as possible, 
so that the internal area enclosed by the traces is as small as possible. In theory at least, this should keep the inductance of all of the loops small, regardless of component position. So now I got my third board in the setup. Let's close everything up, resupply the circuit, and again if we run this measurement, we can see that the noise slightly shifted, we got our high frequency noise slightly going up a bit, but again, to get a better look at what happened, let's compare the two measurements on the computer. So, to analyze the measurement, I overlapped it with our previous two measurements. So in pink we have our original measurement, so with the board with all the components spread out. In white we have our measurement with the small loop, so all the components come together. And in orange we have our latest board with all the components spread out, but with the circuit loops all made as small as possible. So if we look around here, so our fundamental switching frequency and the first few harmonics, so we can see that the circuit with the components together in white and the circuit with the small loops in orange are almost identical. So very, very small differences in between the two. And while both of them are doing much, much better than our initial circuit with all the loops spread out. Now, as we move to higher frequencies, we start to see a bit of a difference. So our circuit with the components spread out, but with small loops, tends to have a bit more high frequency noise than the circuit with our small loops. But anyway, it's doing much, much better than our very first circuit. So, in conclusion, if you want to reduce the emissions of your circuit, one fundamental thing you can do is to reduce circuit loops. Now, on the one side, this can be done by bringing components close together. And secondly, this can be done by bringing traces close together. So to keep the areas enclosed by your circuit traces as small as possible. And well, both of these methods need to be applied together. So closed components and small circuit loops. And with that said, hope you got some useful information out of this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be up to date with all my latest videos. And see you next time. Bye bye.